Okay, I think we are ready to begin. A warm welcome to this episode of An Audience with the President. Thanks for joining us. And if it's your first time, an extra warm special welcome. And if you're joining us on the video, I'm glad you were able to watch again and see what we got up to. So my first duty as chair is to hand over to Minister David Bruton, the president of the Spiritualist National Union. David. Thanks, Alv, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It, as always, it's a great pleasure to have you with us for audience with the president. Over the last 12 months, yes, it's getting on for 12 months since we started audience with the president, uh, we've covered a wide range of subjects. Many have a relationship to spiritualism um, and obviously demonstrate to us what a broad field spiritualism covers. Tonight's subject I know is going to be brilliant and fascinating um, because I'm going to welcome as our guest a lady who is a course organiser and tutor at the Arthur Finlay College. She has worked there for many years and brings a very special brand of awareness through mediumship, working with colour and also shamanic practice and tonight's subject, as you're well aware, is um, shamanic practice and spirituality, which obviously is something uh, that is so important to us all to develop that spirituality within ourselves. So without further ado, it gives me very great pleasure to welcome for her first visit to audience with the president, Maureen Mernon. Welcome, Maureen. Thank you so much for joining. Hi, everyone. Thank you. So our format, ladies and gentlemen, is very much the same as always. I will, I will begin by asking Maureen some questions. And obviously, while you're listening to the conversation that we have between us, please think about your questions that you'd like to ask, and you'll get the opportunity a little bit later in the meeting. So Maureen, I'm, my first question to you, and I, I tend to ask most guests this, because I think it gives people context. Um, what brought you into spiritualism? Oh, okay, well, that was very many years ago, um, as you know, but um, it all began to actually do something about it when my uncle was diagnosed with cancer uh, and then he died. Um, there was no recovery, so he died. Uh, and when I looked at him, I just felt that he was somewhere else, that I needed to find out where he was. Uh, and so I started then for the very first time going to my local spiritualist church, which was then in born in Lincolnshire, uh, run by uh, Olga Mays, which I know uh, oh. you probably know, you know, and, and her husband, Daryl Mays, who started the Born Spiritualist Church. Absolutely. Yes. So then uh, you say that uh, your first visit to the Arthur Finlay College was in 1990 uh, and clearly you were um, caught by the college bug because uh, yeah. you, uh, you went back quite a few times I understand as a student. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, I first went David, I took a group from Bourne Church on open week. Oh brilliant. Um, yeah that's how I got and as I walked in the door I mean I had read then a lot of Arthur Finley's books yeah. and as I walked in that front door my mind just said I've come home and that's how, and that is how it's felt ever since. Yes, it, it feels that way I know for many of us within the movement very very special place so then in in, in 1990 um, you, have, you would have obviously uh, known of Gordon or watched Gordon work. Yes yes Absolutely. So uh, you really uh, had the pleasure of some wonderful tutors back in those days, I would imagine. Absolutely. Absolutely. Absolutely stunning um, uh, education that we got then, or I felt that we did. It was primarily a lot of lectures first, but to see people like Gordon Higginson, Albert Best, Mavis Patilla and um, Glyn Edwards and you know be among all that what I used to think was the elite um uh, you know a section of spiritualism it was just amazing 
Yes, absolutely. Very, very wonderful days, undoubtedly. We were very lucky to have such wonderful people there at the beginning of our journey, I suppose, because it's about a similar time for me when I first uh, ventured to the college. Um, so, Maureen, tonight's subject, as well you know, um, is the shamanic practice. Yes. Uh, so first and foremost, um, what, what drew you into your interest in uh, Native American culture? I think, truthfully, I've always had um, uh, a feel for the Native American way of life. I, I love their philosophies. I love the fact that they lived such a simplicity, but it's a, it's a simplicity that's timeless. Um, and having spent so much time going over there now, you know, spent 15 years at least going over to the reservations in North and South Dakota and to the Cherokees as well, um, I really fell in love with the, the the concept of how life on earth should be you know we should respect things so much more not take anything for granted not take more than we need and learn to be grateful have gratitude and respect for things and that sat very well with me a very very different culture to what we perhaps think of of americans in general yes okay um so Maureen, I understand, as you've said, you went over to the reservations um, and you, you also met a chief. I had met several chiefs, but the first one that I met was, um, there was Albert Whitehat uh, from the Rosebud Reservation in South Dakota. And it was from him that I got my first invite to a Sundance ceremony um, and uh, through being at that Sundance ceremony and spending a few weeks, I stayed on for a few weeks. I met people uh, from the Lower Brule Reservation who I became very friendly with. And it was from there that we decided to start doing um, groups, you know, where I could take groups of people who wanted to learn, you know, at the grassroots of things, you know, not from a book, but from the actual people who live that life. And that's how it came about that I took groups out there. So come on, Maureen, can you explain for the uninitiated amongst us, what is a Sundance ceremony? Okay, a Sundance ceremony is actually one of the most sacred ceremonies of the Lakota people um, in particular. And um, the Sundance ceremony is, um, you may have seen pictures of it or stories about it, where there's a central tree in this, in the dance circle ring and that tree represents God it represents the creator of the universe and all that's within the universe um, and the dancers are fastened to the tree which sounds a little bit barbaric to the, those who don't understand it but they're cut men are cut at the top here and pieces of wood or bone are put through and then leather thongs attached to that that is then attached to the tree and they spend one two three or four days attached to that tree out in the blazing sun and they follow the sun around the sky just keep moving around and um, they do it it's a kind of a I suppose a sacrifice or uh, they believe that we come into this world and we owe nothing but the flesh that we, we we are covered in that's all that we own and that they're by giving that flesh or that blood, they give that sacrifice. They're saying to creator, you know, this is all I have to give. This is my body. This is who I am. Um, you know, but I give it in gratitude and in respect and ask, you know, for prayers for people. Um, and it's done often when they were going to war, you know, when they had to go and do their service. Uh, just the same as any other Americans, that they would, you know, attend Sundance first and, you know, do a Sundance in the hope that they would get that protection. Sounds absolutely fascinating. It's the most spiritual thing I have ever been to in my life, to be truthful with you. That first morning we stood there before six o'clock it was about 5 30 um and suddenly all the sun dancers were gathered uh the men in their red skirts and their hair was loose and they covered in sage bands and almost just as the clock struck six 
It was as if someone turned a switch on and this big golden sun came up over the East Gateway. And as they did that, they filed in with their drums and there was over a hundred sun dancers filled that, that, um, that arena. And they were blowing on their eagle bone whistles up to the sky. And as they did that, two eagles circled the, the, um, the sun dance ring. And you, you can't organize that. No, absolutely. That must have been an amazing atmosphere of energy. Oh, the energy was running through the ground under my feet. I think I cried for the first four hours of the sun dance. I was so moved by the energy. That's, that is tremendous. That's amazing. So Maureen, um, what is a shaman? A shaman, um, and, and I want to say at this point that uh, the shaman goes back through all time because shamanism is the oldest spiritual practice in the world and it's in every culture it is not um you know only confined to certain cultures or certain areas of the world it is global it's found in every single country because the shaman is like the spiritual leader Yes. He's that he or she, because it can be male or female, they are the medium, so they are the communicator between the worlds because they know how to communicate with those that have passed on they are healers they are and they work very much with plant medicines and natural medicines they are also teachers they teach the young and um uh, and the people they are confidants they're friends that they're, they're really just almost like just the top man of any tribal society and from what you've said then maureen it sounds to me as if there are a lot of parallels between shamanic practice and spiritualism. Absolutely. And that's what I think made me make that comparison between what we do in training as mediums, healers, teachers, etc. There's a strong bond here, a strong line that links us to what is natural. And that's what shaman shamanism is about. All things that are natural. And don't we say that with our mediums? Very often we find it's something we brought into this world with us. Um, and, and therefore we've always been sensitive for a great many of us. I mean, I saw spirits when I was a child, but didn't know then what it was. But with you know getting into the shamanic um, side of things, I really understood how and why I was actually drawn to spiritualism because the comparisons were so strong. That's, that's amazing. So they they obviously practice mediumship in in one form or another. Absolutely, always they have always practiced mediumship. They have great communication skills um, with the spiritual world, and they believe so strongly in the power of the spiritual world, both of the living world and the unseen world. So really, um, that practice, which clearly predates spiritualism, from what you've said. Mm -hmm. Um, they were laying the groundwork, I suppose, for, for spiritualism to follow in some respects. Absolutely. I suppose in a way, if you think about it, it's very possible that all other religious bodies have grown out of shamanism. They've grown out of this spiritual connection with seen and unseen worlds. That, that is absolutely fascinating. And um, I know that um, you've talked about uh, the practice being pretty widespread. Um, you talk about Japan and um, shamanism there. This is well, literally all over. Where at whatever country you go to, and you look back in history, you will find evidence of shamanic practices in the past, in the present, and today it's becoming much more, uh, shall we say, looked for. People are searching more and more. I think it's kind of culturally. Um, all over the world, we're looking for our roots. And that's what that's what shamanism is about. It aims to reconnect us, to kind of help us to find our own authenticity. Well, we're very uh, tied up at the moment with well-being and that kind of approach. So clearly shamanism can, can feed that, I would have thought. Yes, 
Yes, absolutely. I am sure that there are, I mean, I, I was fortunate enough in the Native American uh, um, cultures as well to meet many medicine men um, who dealt, you know, very much with natural medicines, plant medicines, spirit medicine. I've been to, um, to been invited into uh, healing ceremonies with Native American Indians and their practice of spiritual um, healing is not way off what we do, you know, with prayers, with um, they smoke a pipe, but, um, you know, we obviously don't do that, but they, they do very other similar things to we do because they believe that they can, if they contact with respect, with truth, with love, with uh, no demands that to the spirit world, that they are, they can kind of call upon that healing power that comes from the great spirit. So then, the oh, same. Sorry, carry on if you, if, if you want to finish. No, no, I'm just saying, and, and so shamanism is virtually exactly the same. It's looking at our, because we, what's happened is we have lost our connection with nature. We, we well, when we say, we've lost our connection with nature we've really lost our connection with ourselves and what we are searching for is that part of ourselves that actually is very natural we become too and i hope you forgive me for saying this but when we get into um, development of our spiritual gifts we think only in terms of our communication and, and contact with the invisible world we tend to dismiss the fact that we have been born into the physical world for a reason, not just for development, but to develop ourselves personally so that we become better people, we become more authentic and as a more authentic and better person, we're going to have a better communication contact with the invisible world. I mean, we talk about these, um, you know, higher beings or those that have, um, you know, moved themselves, you know, beyond uh, physical needs. And that's the kind of energy that we, we get in contact with when we ourselves like the space we stand in and we like the person we are and, and we know with all our heart that we are a good person. It's absolutely fascinating. So Maureen, can I take you back then? to the first shamanic course uh, at Arthur Finley College. Um, when, when was that roughly? Oh, well, let's see. I ran the um, Native American uh, spirituality and culture for about 12 years and, and then I changed it from there on into um, shamanics. And that would be about I would think about 10 years ago. Okay. And over those 10 years, you've been, I know from my knowledge of the college, you get a very strong following on your courses. Um, so you certainly uh, attract people that are looking to extend their own spirituality. Uh, absolutely. Because I think the work to do, I've read a lot of contemporary shamanism, I'll be quite honest with you. And it kept putting me off. I kept thinking mm, I'm not sure and I kept walking away from it and then I kept being drawn back to it and then one day I was just sitting I was actually at the college at the time and I was sitting in meditation in the sanctuary and I'd been thinking about the shamanics practice uh, and, and teaching side again and it was the spirit world who said to me forget the books forget the courses look for it in your own way look for your own shamanic seed and that is exactly what i did that's brilliant and do you feel that it's enhanced your mediumship yes i do i absolutely do i think that once we have understood that we are capable of communicating with spirits of the living world as well as communicating with the spirits of the unseen world, we have to remember that those that we are communicating with in the spirit world, people's loved ones, they have lived a life on this earth. 
and many, many of them would have loved their gardens, they would have loved their countryside, they would have loved their life or certain aspects of their life surely it makes sense that if we are in communication with the spirits of the world in which we are living that we are going to receive better information and better clarity about the lives that were once lived here that has now moved on to the realms of uh, of you know invisible where we were out of a normal range of sight and sound and i know maureen you also work with color and i do very very important in um in your work and uh, and developing that and i suppose in some respects um do you feel it's it's the building blocks if you like it's 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 part of of that basic understanding um to find an expression through the creative energy of of mediumship of color and art and uh, and all of the other creative forces Absolutely, because if we think of colour itself, it's a vibrational energy and we are vibratory beings. So any, any other vibration is going to affect our vibration. And it began when I um, started to see colour around people. I saw flashes of colour. I was intrigued. I wanted to know more about it and I wanted to know how these colours came into being and how they affected us. So I've actually done two diplomas in colour therapy as I wanted to know how it affects me and how it affects other people. And that part, working with that colour, helped me to discover more and more of my own creative side because of course creativity is vibrational energy as well and we always say that creativity is um the language of the soul it's allowing the soul to speak and i also know maureen that trance is a big aspect of the practice of the shamanic of what sorry i missed that trance is is also a big part of shamanic practice absolutely because that's what the shaman would have done in it if he wanted to do healing for someone for example um if i went to a shaman and i said look can you help me i need some healing for a specific purpose the shaman would then go take himself off to maybe a forest or some open space he would take with him in a system because he would need to go into an altered state of consciousness in order to communicate with the spirits of the earth the spirits of the plants the spirits of the spirit world he would need to put himself out of the ordinary mind and into that altered state mind in order to be aware of it so he would have someone drum for him um, when he did that he would then ask the spirits of plants or or tree or root or berry or fungi whatever it was he was working with he would ask that spirit would that spirit assist him to give to bring healing to the person who needs that healing so he wouldn't just take it he would be so respectful about it even if it took two or three or four days but he would keep that communication until he'd received verification that that plant medicine would be a benefit to this person's illness that is quite amazing. And when you think many modern uh, pharmaceuticals are derived from plants, aren't they? Uh, so, you know, uh, this this approach clearly predates all of the pharmaceutical industry and is more than likely much better for us than uh, than some of the uh, the output of the pharmaceutical industry today. Absolutely. It's what's natural. I think it's got to be yes. more beneficial to us. Yeah. I mean, we have to have mainstream medicine, but, you know, I don't see any reason why complementary medicine can't go, you know, along hand in hand. Absolutely. Yes. Because that's what the idea of complementary is, is that everything assists each other. Another question that I have posed to several guests, um, obviously, I think it's right to conclude that our world, like it or not, is in a state of change. Mm. Maureen, do you see humanity maybe moving to a more natural approach that's in sync with the natural rhythm of the planet and, uh, and the world? 
Well, I can answer sort of from my own point of view, and that is that I definitely think that the, the, this big part of this big change change that's going on is we've all gone down a certain pathway for a long time now and it that pathway has distracted us from everything that's natural and normal to us so along the way we've become lost and you hear so many people saying today you know I don't know who I am or where what I'm doing here or where I'm supposed to be going because we've lost the connection to our earthly life now, what I've noticed over the last few years, in fact, I would say over the last 10 years that I've been doing shamanics is that more and more people all around the world are looking to find the path back to their natural selves. They want their roots back. They want to go back to understanding what this life has to offer what this life is all about. Once we know what this life is all about, we have a much better idea of what we have to develop and to give to others. But if we're lost, how can we help others? You know, if we if if we talk about love a lot um, in, within spiritualism, even we, we use that word love quite a lot, uh, but not always in the right context, because it's impossible to love everybody, but it's possible to love yourself on what you are capable of doing and therefore extend that love out within your work that's your passion that's that's the light within you or your belly that that's burning that makes you want to do good uh, and it's all for the greater good if it's coming from the right you know the right source and I find more people are looking for that not necessarily any labels but looking for what who they are and what they have to give and how can they go about giving that at its very, very best. And that's got to be, I think, heartening for society to, to think that we could leave something for the future where people are quite okay with being, well, that's what the I am is, isn't it? This is who I am. Yeah, absolutely brilliant. I also remember from 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 seeing you at times at the college when I passed through um, the drums that you always bring with you on your course. Um, just can you explain again to a novice um, the power of, of, of the drums and you have some beautiful, beautiful drums. Well, I've I mean, drumming is part of the it, the practice of um, of shamanics and journeying and going into altered states. It's used for ceremonies. It's used for frivolity, for dancing, for singing, for enjoyment. Uh, but it's also one of the biggest tools that we have in our shamanic toolbox, really because what we're doing I make drums so I know and I've made hundreds and hundreds of drums um, so I know that when I'm making a drum I am bringing together and that's why we call it birthing a drum I am bringing together first of all the spirit of the animal who has given that skin to us then I'm bringing the spirit of the tree that once stood in that forest and upon mother earth and then I'm bringing in the spirit of the drum maker, which in my case is me. So those three energies I'm asking to come together in a spiritual format that's going to put all the right intentions and ask that the spirit of the animal and the spirit of the tree can work together to create another voice in this world. So your drum isn't just a musical instrument, it is a tool. It's a tool that we use for healing, for trance work, for ceremonies, for prayer. Um, so it, it is a spiritual tool. Um, and uh, that's why I insist on it being done in all the right ways. I know that the skins I get, they come from, mine come from up in Scotland, on the highlands of Scotland. I know their lineage. I know that there are, you know, uh, their herds um, up up there in the highlands that are bred for the meat. So when the meat is taken, 
beforehand all those beautiful hides were were burned or destroyed no we take them and i know the man who tans them he's a seventh generation tanner um i know where the the, the hoops come from it's from a sustainable forest where only sort of um, damaged wind damaged or um old or sick trees that are used um, or, or where it's needed to cull down the trees and there's the bent they're done in the old-fashioned way steam bent in in the woods uh, so I know what the lineage of all my materials come from and therefore when I get the materials together here in my home I can set about doing a great sort of ceremony or honouring. I soak them in rainwater because I know that animal would have been used to rainwater. I add my sacred herbs as an offering of gratitude and blessing on the life of that animal that has, has graced this earth and given us food and now he's going to give us a healing voice. Um, and the same with the tree. And so that and when I put my intention into the drum, I'm putting my energy into the drum. And if I'm making it for a person specifically, I will be putting the intentions of that person into the drum as well, because they are the future drum carrier. That's it's amazing. Absolutely amazing. I, I've, I've always seen the drums there, but never understood that so much uh, intent goes into actually producing one. Oh, now, yeah. Um, so, uh, when we get to a point where the college is open again, um, what can I expect as a student coming on one of your courses? Well, when we start again and we can come back to the, uh, to the shamanic way, um, I like to insist or uh, to explain to all students at the beginning of the course and I say over and over again um, you know without um, without any problem of, of repeating myself I am not providing you with a course to make you a shaman I don't think that I have the right to do that because the shaman is usually it's, again it's something you can be born with um, it can be passed on from mother father to son or daughter um, uh, and there's that special something that they ha all have their whole life. Or it can be that the people choose them because they see special spiritual qualities or abilities. Um, or it can be that they're chosen by God. And sometimes it's a near death experience that does that. So I don't have any of those rights. My aim is to tell it and let each person know that we all everyone has the shamanic seed within them we all of us can trace our lineage back to tribal times you know even pagans and um when we lived in the woods and we lived in groups of people even going back to when we lived in caves um we've got that tribal energy within our dna it's within the soul somewhere and when we find it and we bring it back to life, we bring it back into this part of our earthly journey, then we start to find more and more about ourselves and hopefully get to understand and like eventually love more and more of ourselves. That sounds absolutely amazing. Uh, so clearly you don't to come on your course, you don't need any uh pre-experience or knowledge no. uh you no. just bring your own yourself and uh, a will to learn i'm sure absolutely and so many students say that it is the most spiritual week they've ever been on yeah. um, and they also many of them i get many many messages afterwards that people say it changed their life it makes you look at your life differently it makes you see your world around you differently and you suddenly it 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 kind of clicks that we are connected to all things if we believe as we do that god 
the divine spirit, creator, whatever we wish to call our personal God, um, put everything into being. There's no way would God think that we were any more important and special to life than an ant or a bee or a butterfly or a deer or a horse or any other living thing. Even the trees, you know, have spirits. And I remember Gordon used to believe in elementals as well. I remember uh, him talking about elementals at the college. Absolutely, yes. And uh, the college grounds, it's a beautiful place. And uh, I know you've got your special tree, which you use in the ceremonies. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it, it is truly wonderful, wonderful opportunity. Um, I'm go I've got one more question for you, Maureen, and then I'm going to hand over to Alf uh, to invite questions from our audience this evening. Okay. So everybody the opportunity to quickly think about what they want to ask. Um, Maureen, you live in a very beautiful part of England. Yes, in and, Cornwall. Yeah, absolutely. And seeing some of the photos that you post on social media, it looks absolutely idyllic. Um, is your environment, your locality, is that a big inspiration for your work? I, I think it is. I, I've been here seven years now um, and I've always loved the power of the ocean. I mean, for me, I... Uh, I'll be quite honest with you, when I'm out in nature, if I'm in the forest or I'm in, on the beach by the ocean or in the rocks going on coastal walks, I've never felt closer to God than I do when I'm out there. For me, that's my church out there. So I walk every day. I go out there every day because I, I want to communicate. I want to talk. I want to pray. Um, it, to my God in my way, in my church out there in nature. And, and this, the ocean is just an amazing place to sit and meditate. And believe me, I do it often. I've sat there and watched the sunset come up, you know, the sunrise. I've watched the sunset on hundreds of occasions. That must be amazing, absolutely amazing. Um, and I, I think I'm right to say that later this year, uh, if people aren't able to get to the Arthur Finley College, you're also doing a course at the Barbanel Centre in Stafford. That's correct. Yes, I am. And, and that's going to be on um, shamanism as well. Brilliant. So, ladies and gentlemen, if from listening to Maureen tonight, uh, we've whetted your appetite uh, to join her on a course, uh, there's obviously, as soon as the college opens, the opportunity there and also at the centre. So now uh, I think I've spoken enough. I'm going to hand you over to our chairman, Alv, and give everyone the opportunity to ask their own questions. Alv, over to you. Thank you, David. Thank you, Maureen. Uh, a very easy one to begin with, Maureen. Uh, Celia is asking, uh, what courses do you have coming up at the Arthur Finley College? So I guess either online or fingers crossed when we get open again. Um, well, uh, when we open again, we've missed the first of the shamanic ones, but I've got um, coming up the, um, I think it's in July, which is the uh, about connection with shamanic animals and how animals play a big part um, in our lives as guides and uh, uh helpers you know that kind of thing uh, our close relationship with animals both in the living world and in the spirit world and then also I'm doing one at the uh, Barbanel Centre and then I'm doing an online one in April I'm going to be doing a it's three workshops it will cover three tasters of of shamanics that will be done um on uh, the, the college website the college zoom Thank you, Maureen. Now, the first question that came, quite a few have come through on, on the chat box. And what the first one came through quite early on uh, in the meeting, and that was about, we, I think, if I remember, you were talking about the Sundance. And someone asked about the tree and that they've read a little bit about shamanic practice and wondered if you could explain a little bit more about what you've discovered about the importance of the tree uh, within the shamanic pathway. 
Okay, well, the the tree I spoke about first was in the sun dance, and don't mix, don't put shamanism with Native American culture. They tend to not use the word shaman, especially the Lakota. They would use more like medicine man or woman or holy man or woman. Uh, but shamanism is a worldwide cultural thing you know um it's, it's in every culture some in native american tribes will use the word shaman but the tree um as for the native american indian i mean that one in the sun dance you they always used a dogwood tree and they would choose it 12 months before they cut it and constantly do ceremony and respectful things prayers to with the tree um, so that the tree spirit would cooperate with them but for trees in general the native americans and in shamanism um, are often referred to as the standing people um, and we believe that trees can teach us an awful lot about the altered states of consciousness because they are like other plant um, um, species they're rooted to the ground so they cannot move they cannot you know diversify and move to towards you or away from you so they can teach us about being in the now being in the present in the now so when you're in a forest or when you're with trees sometimes you will feel that energy from a tree i know my friend um helen devita once went to a science fair at kew gardens in london and uh, part of this science demonstration was that they put electrodes into uh, the trees and they let you listen on headphones to what was these electrodes were picking up and she said you could hear like the gurgling sound, like blood flowing through veins, you know, as the sap is moving through the trees. It's very similar. She said you could also hear a heartbeat. And what was most unusual, she felt, was that when they were told to touch the tree, to put their hands on the tree, the heartbeat speeded up. And when they took their hands away, the heartbeat went back down to a normal rhythm. Now, just imagine, you know, you're a tree in a forest and they've proven scientifically that trees that are being cut down send off signals to other trees within that forest to tell them that there's danger. They know they also have a family network whereby their roots touch and intermingle with each other and they can keep a tree alive if a tree is sick or ailing. You know, if you ever, ever read a book called The Secret World of Trees, it tells you some amazing facts about it. So shamanism believes in the spirits of the trees and all plants for that matter. But trees in particular, I feel, are just, they really, um, they really make you feel, well, if you're like me anyway, when you go into a forest, you feel like you're protected, like you're being watched, you're not alone. I can go and sit in the forest and just find a log and sit down and just listen to all the sounds. And when there's no one else around, it's amazing. It's just wonderful. And I did uh, put my neck on the line here and tell you that I once had a communication from a tree personally. I had a communication from a tree when I wanted to plant a tree in my garden before I moved here in my other house. I wanted a silver birch. And my husband said, no, you can't have a silver birch. He said, because they grow too big and it will take out a lot of light on this side of the garden. You've already got two big trees on the other side. So I said, okay. And I went to the garden center and chose a plant that gets yellow blossoms on it. And I left it near the greenhouse for quite a few weeks and didn't put it in right away. And then I went out to do it one day. And as I pulled it out of the pot, there was a little sapling growing in the pot with the bush. And it just happened to be a silver birch. I repotted it, got it to grow. I planted it in my garden. The bush died, but the tree was about 30 feet tall when I left. Now, I'd heard on a gardening program that it's a good idea if you've got straight trunks of a tree to buy clematis, plant them at the bottom and train it to grow around the trunk of the tree and through the branches. And then you will get beautiful flowers in your branches. 
I thought it was a marvelous idea. So I got one for the rowan tree and one for the silver birch. I planted the rowan tree, Climatus, no problem. But even if I never move from this spot, I'm telling you the truth. I walked across my garden holding a pot of clematis and my trowel. And as I got a few feet away from the tree, I heard, not inside my head, I heard it outside because I am Claire audience and I heard it right here. I heard a voice say, no, I am known for my beautiful silver bark. I do not want it to be hidden. And I just stopped in my stride. I just, oh, you know, and my husband said, what's the matter with you? And I said, I can't plant this. The tree doesn't want it. The tree said, no, you know. So after a few strange looks, he, he got used to me, but I didn't plant it there. And instead I got water and a little brush and I scrubbed the bark, I've exfoliated it, made her look beautiful. She shone, you could see her in the dark. Well, I, thought, <laughs> I heard it, I heard that tree speak to me. An amazing story there, Maureen. And I, I'm glad you listened to the tree. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure it appreciated it. I'm going to go over and invite Ricky to uh, switch on her microphone and speak to you. Go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, sometimes I have clients who are asking me, who is my animal? Do you see animal guide with me? I, 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 I don't have a clue. How, what would be the best way to, to respond to these people? Because it's, it's, you know, it's quite a few people that are asking this question. Mm -hmm. Well, usually what will happen if a spirit animal comes to work with a person, they will usually reveal themselves to that person themselves. Now, that might be in a dream. It might be in a meditation. It might be that they're out about in their daily lives and suddenly an animal, say, for instance, you were traveling to work and one morning you saw a fox in a field as you were driving past. Uh, and that was unusual. And then a few times within the next few weeks, you saw that fox again. That's a good indication that that fox is trying to get your attention. So what you need to tell your client is to sit and meditate. Not just once, but ask the spirit world, what animal chooses to work with me? And, and if they get the same animal several times, that is usually a wonderful indication that that animal has come to work with you. If we've got time, I have got a tiny little story I can tell you about one that happened to me that would just give you that example. Uh, and it was one night I went to bed. I wasn't thinking about animals, I swear. But all night I was playing with an otter. I can tell you what it felt like. It was the silky skin. It was so beautiful, this female otter. She was running up and down my body and I only woke when and she bent down and a wet nose kissed my cheek and it woke me up. And I just thought, now an otter, why has an otter come to me in my dreams? I said to the spirit world, if this otter's come to work with me, I need uh, uh, three more, um, you know, verifications to say, yes, this animal has come. That day, I took the dog for a walk down by the river, and for the first time ever, I saw a river otter. And I thought, okay, I'll accept that. The week after that, I was invited over to the Cherokee Reservation to their tribal lands for the Thanksgiving powwow. As I was walking up the road on the tribal lands, the chief tall oak Martin was coming and walking towards me. And he stopped a few feet away from me and he just said, hey, he said, do you know you've got otter medicine with you? Oh. <laughs> so I told him about the dream and he said, that wasn't a dream, that was a vision. Two days later, two che one, a Cherokee lady came over to me and she said, will you come over to our trailer? She said, We've, me and my sister have made something for you. We have a little gift for you. So I said, yeah, of course. So I went over for a coffee and they gave me a little parcel wrapped in red material. When I opened it, they'd made me an otter purse. Oh, that's a beautiful story. Three times. So from then on, I took otter and she's still with me today so you could say to your client the animal will reveal itself a power animal that wants to work with you will find you it will come to you thank you very much it's wonderful thank you very much you're welcome nice to speak to you ricky yes. 
Thank you, Ricky, for a great question. Uh, and a question uh, from Helen in the chat box, who asks of you, Maureen, uh, what's, your be what's your experience been of integrating shamanic practices into your practice, or so practices such as drumming, into perhaps things such as maybe healing or open circles, things like that? And do you think that those practices help to raise the vibrations and strengthen the power of the spirit? What are your thoughts? Absolutely. I definitely do. Because I think when we're drumming, particularly with healing, um, that we are we are creating a sound remember we're creating the drum voice uh, and that's a vibrational energy remember i said that we are vibratory beings so other vibrations will affect us and if the drummer is drumming in a positive way so the drummer's intention is also a part of this just like the healer when you're having spiritual healing um then that has a, such a powerful healing energy we've had some wonderful wonderful results um, with drum healing and once you are used to drum healing it's part of the sound healing therapy um, once you've experienced vibrational healing sound healing you actually fall in love with it it really is a a, a beautiful way of to integrate sound and natural sound because you know don't forget that the drum represents the human heartbeat because in the very, very beginning of our journey here into Earth, even when we were only, you know, as tiny as your little finger, we were nestled in the dark in our mother's womb, listening to her heartbeat, her drum. Boom, 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 boom. That's what we grew into life, listening to that drum beat. Until our own drum beat started, our own heart and our own heart is our life's drum beat and it only when that drum beat stops does our this journey come to an end is there anything else i can say about that too have i, I think, answered that helen I, I think you have i think that's a, a a wonderful answer um another question that's come in from uh, the chat box and it's about your your time in, in America on, on, on the, uh, the settlements. And do you, do you feel that there, for you, was there a sense of culture shock and how were you seen? And, and were they interested in your mediumistic abilities as well? Uh, I, I certainly didn't find it a culture shock in a bad way. I found it a culture shock in a very good and positive way. Um, I think part of my mind wondered if they would be a little hostile to us or if they still held any grudges. I never, ever in the in 15 years in total, I was going over to the Indian reservations. I never once met any hostility. In fact, I would say quite the opposite uh, to that. Um, at that first sun dance I told you about. For four days, I stood in the harbor next to this beautiful Native American lady with her long hair right down, you know, touching her rear end, so to speak, and a beautiful blanket around her. And we just kept nodding to each other and smiling. And on the last day, she came to me and she said, excuse me. She said, are you uh, the lady who's come all the way from the United Kingdom to join our ceremony? And I said, uh, yes, yes, I am. And she said to me, well, she said, we're very honored that you've made this journey, that you've come all this way to be with us. And I said, oh, no, I said, I'm the one that's honored. I said, I am non-Indian. I said, and I know how precious this ceremony is to your culture. I said, but uh, you still invited me here, uh, uh, for which I'm very grateful. And she just took hold of my hands and she looked me straight in the eye. And she said uh, to me, oh, no, she said, the creator does not judge you to be Indian by the color of your skin. It's the color of your heart. And I thought that was just so amazing, so beautiful. And she was, she turned out to be Miriam Standing Bear, which is, she was is a descendant of the original Standing Bear um, from a long time ago. And Glyn Edwards had a very strong connection to Standing Bear. 
That's such a rich theme of experience that you've encountered, Maureen. I think we've got time for a very quick question now before we run out of time. And Helena asks about the sweat lodge. And I guess it would be useful uh, if we could explain a little bit about that to our audience. But as have you got any intentions of, of using that in your teaching or, or the experiences that, that you have? Um, well, I, I was taught how to do the sweat lodges properly when I was with the Cherokees and uh, the tribal mother of the Cherokees in uh, Jacksonville in Florida gave me permission to do sweat lodges in this country and I have done so, uh, lots of, of sweat lodges in this country. Um, I've done about, in, for myself, I've done sweat lodges with a medicine woman as well. I must have done over 50 sweat lodges over the years. Um, and I love it because what the sweat lodge is, a lot of people think is a bit like the, you know, Scandinavian saunas and that. It is to some extent, apart from its spiritual connotations. Because when we enter into the sweat lodge, we build the sweat lodge, everybody going in, you, you take your part in helping to build it. And it's built out of willows um, because they're so bendable. And we made, made like a kind of an igloo shape uh, with the door facing the east. And then we cover it with blankets and tarpaulin so that it's very, very dark inside. And inside the sweat lodge, there is a, a pit that's dug in the earth um, to it, it ready to receive the hot stones when they come in. Outside, we have an even bigger pit and the fire is going and the stones will have been in there for a few hours until they're glowing red. Uh, the stones and once we're in the sweat lodge we go into the sweat lodge and we touch the earth um, some people bend down with their forehead and kiss the earth and they use the words which means I do this for all my relations that means for all life upon earth and coming into a prayer lodge because we say that it, this, the sweat lodge is going back into the womb of mother earth so as we sit there, once we're all in and the first stones come in, then the door is closed and the first round of prayers are said. And that is happens four times. And each time it's each round is getting hotter and hotter because more and more stones are coming in. Water is being poured on the stones, which causes the steam and the heat to disperse. Um, and we sit in the dark, we do lots of different prayer rounds. Um, and then at the end of the sweat lodge, and it usually takes approximately three to three and a half hours that you're in that lodge. I have done sweats with um, a medicine woman and we were in there for five hours, which was quite a long time. But when we come out, we come out facing the east. And as we face the east, we're facing the new dawn, the new day, the, the beginning of, of everything. So what we're being reborn, so to speak. So you, we've been cleansed with the sweat and the prayers. And now we are entering back into the into life and into our world, it, reborn with a, a cleansed spirit um, and and a, a stronger, um, you know, a soul connection with life to, to be better than we were. What an amazing experience. I'm afraid we're almost out of time now. I think we could go on all evening. I, looking at the comments in the chat box, people are absolutely fascinated and love hearing all these things, absolutely. So I will pass back now to Minister David Bruton for his final comments, David. Well, in conclusion and wrapping up, um, our attempts to understand and express our spirituality clearly can be informed by so many sources. And I think I'd like on your behalf to give our thanks to Maureen. It has been a fascinating evening. We promised you a good evening. And I think Maureen, you have delivered with spades. Thank you so, so much for being with us. And uh, it's I, I personally, I, I didn't come in with a great deal of knowledge. I've learned so much. And I, I personally feel I'd like to experience some of these things that you've you've explained so wonderfully this evening. So Maureen, thank you for joining us, for accepting the invitation and for sharing your knowledge, which is quite amazing. Thank you so much. 
Well, and thank you to you. Thank you to you, Dave, and to everyone who's been tonight. And thank you to the college as well, because the college allowing me to do shamanics now at the college has helped to expand that opportunity and knowledge out to so many other people in so many other countries. And that's what spiritualism for me is about, is we accept all forms of spirituality. We don't need labels. We just need the spirit. Absolutely. It's the practice that counts. Brilliant. Can I just tell you, ladies and gentlemen, very quickly, as time is, is pressing on, um, that next week on Monday evening, seven o'clock, as always, we have ministers Judith Seaman and Stephen Upton, and they will be talking about living life as a spiritualist. You may think you know what that means. I can promise you an equally interesting evening, and it may just push the boundaries of your understanding of the true essence of spiritualism. On the 29th of this month, we have our Hydesville special, and we'll be wel welcoming a lady called Tracy Murphy, who is the caretaker of the Hydesville Cottage uh, in New York State, America. She's also a historian, and I'm sure she will provide a fascinating evening to really kick off our, our week of Hydesville celebrations within the SNU and also on SNUI. So that promises to be a fascinating evening. On the 5th of April, we will have our reincarnation special with guests Charles Colston and Brian Gledhill. So again, that judging from our a special on reincarnation we did in the second series, that will be equally interesting. And I hope that we can perhaps spend a little bit more time picking apart this fascinating subject that I'm sure attracts many of us. Can I finally remind you before I hand back to Alf that um, our next Sunday is the census day here in the UK, in England, Wales and Northern Ireland. And if you haven't already completed your census, you need to do it by next Sunday online. Um, you should have received a, a letter in the post that tells you how to go about it. And you will be asked as part of the census what your religion is. If you're happy and proud as we are to call yourself a spiritualist, please reflect that in the census question. There isn't a tick, tick box for spiritualism. We have tried very hard to get one, but if you go and if you click on the other box, it will allow you to enter spiritualist as your religion. Let's be proud to be spiritualists and get our numbers to a point where perhaps in 10 years time, the next census, we will have our own tick box. So can I thank Maureen again? Can I thank all of our audience who as always have been fantastic and interesting and brought very interesting questions forward? And can I thank as always uh, our chairman, Alf, for keeping everything running and operating. And I was praying so hard because the internet link with Maureen in Cornwall kept uh, dropping slightly. And I thought, oh, as long as we can get to the end of the hour. We did it, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks, Al. Look forward to seeing you next week. Good night. God bless. Take care. Thank you, David. Thank you, Maureen. And on behalf of everybody, I'm sure just to extend our gratitude again, I can see everybody's loved this hour. You can catch up with what else is happening in the Spiritualist National Union by visiting our social media channels. So if you're on Facebook, it's at, at the Spiritualist National Union. And we'll be releasing details over the next few days of all the Hydesville activities that are happening. And there will be a special Hydesville service on the day itself, which, of course, is March the 31st. You can join us on Twitter and Instagram, which is at Spiritualist SNU. And this recording will be on our YouTube channel, which is SNU Film. So take a look there and you'll find the film uh, of today and the previous audience with the president uh, sessions as well. Look forward to seeing you next week, same time, same place. Until then, stay safe and God bless. Bye-bye everyone.